Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, welcome back everyone to the uh, Contemporary Islamic Movement Forum. My name is Nurul Ifa Amani binti Mazhalimi and I will become your moderator for today. So for today, inshallah, we will be discussing on a topic regarding an Islamic movement in Malaysia which is ABIM or its real name is Angkatan Belia Islam Malaysia. Before that, I would like to introduce all of our panels for today's forum. First of all, we have Professor Dr. Hikmah Tambizi, uh, Professor Dr. Akasha Sa'arani, Professor Dr. Afza Iwani, Assistant Professor Dr. Siti Fakira, Assistant Professor Dr. Farah Iliani, and Assistant Professor Dr. Ina Samiha. So, without wasting any time, I would like to ask our first panel, which is Professor Dr. Hikmah Tambizi. So, Professor, for the introduction, uh, can you give us a brief history uh, and background of ABIM? Alright, thank you to our moderator for the question. So, inshallah, I will be answering the question regarding the historical background of ABIM. So, on 6 August 1971, during an international trend of Islamic revivalism, ABIM was founded by Ustad Abdul Wahab Zakaria. So, in particular, the organization was founded by Muslim students, the PKPIM, National Union of Malaysian Muslim Students, and promoted Islam through um, its charity work and education programs aimed at the poor. So, a private school known as the Institute, Yayasan Anda, acted as a hub for promoting Islamic education. The widespread cynicism among the youth against secularization and westernization helped the organization's popularity. In the early stages of the Malaysian Da'wah movement, Abim also sponsored and assisted Islamic students practicing Da'wah, the preaching of Islam. So according to Bablo and Fili, the Muslim Brotherhood, um, Ikhwanul Muslimin, which the authors identify as both a socio-political phenomenon and an intellectual trend or current within Islamism, has inspired and influenced Abim. And then Abim registered its non-governmental body, NGO, with the Registrar of Societies, Pendaftar Pertubuhan, on 1972 under the Establishment Act 1966, Akta Pertubuhan 1966. So the first Muktamar Abim was held in 1972 where Ustaz Razali Nawawi, now Professor Dr. Razali Nawawi, was elected as the first president of Abim, while Anwar Ibrahim, now Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim, was elected as Secretary General. So during the late 1970s, the group reached its peak um, with a call to return through the advocacy channel to the basics and the true teachings of Islam. And then, in 1974, Anwar Ibrahim was appointed as the second president of ABIM. Uh, Ustaz Siddiq Fadil, now Datuk Dr. Siddiq Fadil, was appointed to act and subsequently became the president of ABIM after the participation of Anwar Ibrahim in AMNO in 1982. So Ustaz Muhammad Nurmanuti, now Dr. Muhammad Nurmanuti, was appointed president in 1991. In September 1997, Ahmad Azam Abdul Rahman was elected as the fifth president of ABIM at the 26th Muktamar Sanawi ABIM in Adusta Kedah. Alright, so in the 1970s era when Abim was under the leadership of Ustaz Razali Nawawi and Anwar Ibrahim, Abim took a confrontational approach and thus Abim became vocal on several policies and stances of the government. This approach was felt to fit the demands and needs of the era. So in the second decade, uh, 1980s, during the leadership of Ustaz Siddiq Fadil, the ABIM approach was marked by a change in orientation from confrontational approach towards a problem-solving approach. Also through the notion of partnership in nation building with the government because of you know, the participation of Anwar Ibrahim in the government, ABIM uh, revived its policy. The idea that was also referred to as the reform from within had undergone a highly successful phase particularly when the idea of establishing Islamic university and Islamic banking originally derived from the annual General Assembly of ABIM was realized through the establishment of the 
International Islamic University of Malaysia IIOM in 1982 and Bank Islam Malaysia Berhad in 1983. So Abim consistently criticized the government for an organization that was normally not political, particularly in the scope of good governance that is incompatible with the Islamic principle. Uh, and then in the new millennium, Ahmad Azam Abdul Rahman brought the theme of the restoration of idealism to repolish the dynamics of struggle and the agenda of uniting the ummah in line with the current urgent demands. So, Abim continues to be the spokesperson for the ummah in various dimensions so that the ummah as a whole is protected in their faith, life, property, dignity, freedom, rights and security. Okay, so Professor, can you estimate the total members that Abim has now? Because uh, I heard that Abim is one of the uh, organisation that have a massive amount of members. Yes, it had a few hundred members at its formation. By 1986, the group had 40,000 members and now has almost 60,000 members. And the mission of Abim has continuously received um, encouraging support from Muslims in Malaysia as a powerful youth-based non-partisan movement led by 9th President Muhammad Raimi Abdul Rahim, Abim now remains. They became one of the most powerful religious pressure groups nationally, supporting the concept of moderation and progressive thought. So that's all from me to answer the question. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dr. Hikmah Tanbizi. Now we move on to our next panel, which is Professor Dr. Akasha. So for the first question, uh, Professor, would you explain to us briefly our, about the nature of ABIM itself? Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank to our moderator today. So, yeah. InshaAllah, now I will be explaining the nature of ABIM itself. Uh, before that, I believe that um, each and every organization in this world created purposely according to what goals and uh, changes that need to achieve and the same goes to ABIM and as what has been discussed earlier, I know and I believe that ABIM is no longer strange in our community and even though it seems that ABIM always against the government uh, system or rules but actually, ABIM has its own intention, mission and vision. And the main uh, intention of ABIM is actually to fight for good things, uh, for big, uh, society from uh, any evil things. I mean from uh, what things that contradicted with the teaching of Islam, ABIM try to uh, fight for it. All right? And... Um, I know that ABIM is so active in leading towards um, the mission to coordinate intensively the Muslim youth activism not within Malaysia and not only that, internationally. And um, if we go through the website of ABIM itself, uh, we can see um, how they uh, describe themselves um, to, bring, to bring up the culture of knowledge, the spiritual um, practices, Amal Shura, Amal Jama'i. Besides, they also highlighted that uh, the understanding of um, the current issue is also important for them to, um, to develop uh, the organization. And they also tried to build uh, the, the soul of jihad. We always um, heard that um, jihad fisabilillah, jihad fisabilillah, and this is what I've been trying to fight, try to build, try to, try to practice, right? So, as we know that we are now in, um, in this pandemic that requires us to not uh, get contact directly with people, but alhamdulillah, I've been successfully um, get contact active with the society with the people through online and um, recently abim um, had organized a forum entitled compassion and mercy common uh, between common values between islam and buddhism um, with the collaboration um, 
TB10 Buddhism Center, Culture Center TBCC, and Alhamdulillah, it uh, it went smoothly. And um, yeah, it, uh, here I want to explain one of the natures of Abim is actually to respect other belief and I mean other religion, right? We know that it is a part and parcel um, in our life to respect other 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 belief. Um, even though we know that Islam is the only religion that accepted by by God by Allah, all right. But still, we have to uh, be, uh, we have to respect them. And this forum also mentioned that um, this pandemic should unite them and not instead of dividing them apart from each other. So yeah i think um, this is one of the nature of abin try to celebrate the mutual understanding harmony and also affirmation of common ground so yeah i think that's it for the nature of abin i see how about their logo all right um the logo of abin uh, when we talk about the logo of abin itself is actually uh, featured by the symbol of crescent at the bottom and the word or the kalimah of Allah in the middle. And most importantly, the word of Angkatan Belia Islam uh, Malaysia is written in Jawi alphabet. Okay, thank you. So, um, according to what I have read, uh, Abim has done many activities and rituals during this pandemic uh, of COVID-19. Which one of them are helping to support the urban poor, including refugees and foreign workers that are impacted by the COVID-19 outbreak? Is it true? That's true. Um, as what I have mentioned before, uh, Abim successfully organized a forum um, with the uh, Buddhism region to to get mutual understanding, harmony and all that. Actually, Abim has so many projects. Um, one of it is um, the Brill History Book Fund, um, Abim, organized by Abim and also Yayasan Orang Buta Malaysia, Y-O-B-M, a campaign to collect fund uh, to buy history book for this community. I mean, yeah, this community should not be left behind, all right? Not only the book is costly, uh, the price is uh, about 90, 90 ringgit. And not only that, uh, the, the book is not easy to get it. So we must not neglect this community. So we know that education for everyone uh, to ensure that blind people also have the ability to discover, read books and learn um, in accordance with the rapid um, development um, of technology in this country. So I think not only that, they have more. I don't think that I have to explain um, all but yeah indeed abim is actually active even though it's uh during um covid 19 pandemic thank you so much professor dr uh, akasha sanroni now we move on to our third panel which is assistant professor dr afza iwani for the first question according to what i know professor uh, there is a student association made by abim for university students which is known as pkpim uh, so doctor i would like to ask what is pkpim and its role uh, to create the awareness of islamic revivalism among muslim students thank you sister ifa moderator of this forum for asking question persatuan kebangsaan pelajar islam malaysia or known as pkpim was established on 31 March 1961. The aim is to become an organization that represents Muslim students in Malaysia and to strengthen the bond of brotherhood among all students in Malaysia. PIM is also the parent body of Muslim student associations in Malaysia in carrying out students' activities. It means that PKPIM is a medium that acts as a representative to uh, present the concerns and needs of Muslim students, specifically concerning education, cultural and social, and many other issues to the parties involved. 
in conjunction, PKPIM also presents Muslim students at Islamic conferences domestically and abroad for strengthening the the Islamic Brotherhood by collaboration with the same organizations that are engaging with PKPIM. To improve the understanding of Islam, PKPIM had used the works of great Islamic figures as the material for debate and discussion. Several students who are interested in Islam were successfully produced through discussions related to socio-political issues, economics, education, and so on, but rooted in the way Islamic way of life. Um, in fact, Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim, as the president of PKPIM in 1969 and 1970, has brought this idealism to the entire student community and has finally raised awareness and consciousness of the Islamic revival movement among students at that time. Through the Islamic ideas produced by Syed Al Qutub, Hassan Al Banna, Abu Al Al Maududi, and other Islamic figures involved in highlighting the Islamic ideologies, has become a compulsory read, uh, reading material and a reference for PKPIM members. Next is the efforts um, of translation of religious books in English and Arabic into the Malay language are actively implemented and disseminated throughout all the throughout the universities in Malaysia by PKPIM. From that students under the leadership of Datu Sri Anwar Ibrahim began to learn Islam seriously and they formed Usrah groups to discuss Islamic studies. Alright, thank you. Um, Professor, uh, could you tell us more about the involvement of PKPIM in the establishment of UIA? The establishment of an Islamic university in this country is an issue that is fighting for since its inception of PKPIM. The culmination of this claim was when the Islamic University Congress was organized by PKPRM at the Faculty of Islamic Studies UKM on 3 August 1971 in conjunction with uh, 10th PKPRM General Conference. Several paperworks were presented including Professor Zainal, Ab Zainal Abidin Wahid. At that time, he was the Dean of Faculty of History UKM and Tansri Abdul Jalil Hassan, Dean of Faculty of Islamic Studies UKM. The factors that lead to the establishment of Islamic University are due to the real problem of moral decay among teenagers because of the obvious influence by the Westerners and the materialistic culture that has occurred. Besides for correcting the misunderstandings of Islam in society as well as the medium of supporting religious students background so that they can pursue their studies in university. PKPRM struggle is based on the idea that Islam is merciful, means that if the society follows the way of Islam, then Islam will bring um, benefit to people. The effort to establish an Islamic university is a long-term struggle to solve the Ummah problem and beyond to achieve uh, peace and harmony in society. It also uh, expected that university, that university can produce leaders who are trustworthy, fair and responsible within the community for promoting great moral and akhlaq. In line with its commitment, PKPIM makes the issue of establishment of an Islamic university is as the main agenda that will continue to be fought until the establishment of the Islamic University. Um, at the 17th Muqtamar of uh, PKPIM on 29 September until uh, 1 October 1978, one of its proposals was to urge the government to set up the Islamic University Task Force and to set the actual date of the establishment of the, the university. Um, finally, uh, the Islamic University was officially established on um, 12 January 1982. 
Thank you so much, uh, Assistant Professor Dr. Afsa Iwani. So we move on to our fourth panel, which is Assistant Professor Dr. Fakira. So for the first question, Doctor, who is among the prominent leaders from ABIM and uh, why they are said to be the prominent leaders? Thank you to the moderator for the question. So it is about the prominent figures from ABIM. Actually, ABIM's name itself already well known by the people in Malaysia. Although it is already well known, yet there are people not aware or not knowing about the leaders, about the figures from ABIM that being the backbone of this movement. So, um, today I will share some of them and among of them is the pioneer leaders in this movement. Basically, the pioneer leaders absorbed some elements from other Islamic movements outside of Malaysia to establish this movement. So let's move on to the first prominent leader from ABIM. I guess everyone know this person. Who is it? He is Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim. Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim, he was born in 10th August 1947 in Cerok Tokun, Bukit Mertajam, Penang. And he played very important role in establishment of ABIM since he was a student of University Malaya. He was a secretary of PKPIM and also the president of PKPIM after that. So why I say that he is important in establishment of ABIM? Because he got the idea of the establishment during his time in PKPIM. Because there is one day where he went to the London for the World Assembly Youth and in that meeting, it led to the idea of creating the Islamic movement for the Muslim students' activities. And from there, the idea was conceived and ABIM was established in conjunction with the 10th conference of PKPIM. And then after that, he became the second president of ABIM because the first one is Dr. Razali Nawawi and then Dr. Sri Anwar Ibrahim became the second president of ABIM. And during his presidencies, there are a lot of articles from various publications that always mentioning him as the Islamic prominent leader, which means he was a really influential and a famous figure because of his credibility in leading the movement. And the highlight of his personality is that he had a very strong voice since he was in PKPIM and it's already made a big picture of him as the prominent leader. And after he participated in ABIM, Anwar Ibrahim started to active in political activities. And from there, there are some controversies, but that I will not uh, discuss about it today. But the main point is that Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim is still active in political activities until right now. And I guess he still wants to contribute to the society and also the Muslim. Okay, thank you. Um, just now you said that uh, they were taking some examples from other Islamic movement. May I know which Islamic movement are they referring to? Oh yes, thank you for the second question from the moderator. Yes, actually I have still two more figures, the prominent figures in ABIM that I will share. So, um, to make it short, we have the first president of ABIM, right? So I will talk about him. Our first president of ABIM is Dr. Razali Nawawi. And for your information, he studied overseas, which is at America. And from there, he met a lot of Muslims from other countries. And from there, he met. From there, he learned about the ideas of Ikhwan al-Muslimin, or we call it as Muslim Brothers. Brotherhood that was founded by Hassan Al Banna, so that is the Islamic movement that I say just now. So from there, Dr. Razali Nawawi introduced Usrah during his presidencies. So what is interesting about this Usrah is that it has became uh, a weekly activity or monthly activity, not just in PKPIM and ABIM, but also in other societies, also in other movements. So from here, we can see that how Razali Nawawi shaped the member of the organization then influenced other people, other Muslims to spread the da'wah. 
And for your information also that he is the first dean of Kuliah Law at International Islamic University Malaysia, IIUM. I see. So it seems like Abim have shown uh, that they play a, an, an important role in shaping more Islamic and credible leaders. So for the next panel uh, is uh, Assistant Professor Dr. Farah Ilyani. So doctor, for the first question, uh, can you walk us through the organizational structure for Abim and the committees? My name is Farah Ilyani and today I would like to thank um, our chairperson Ifa Amani who has asked the question just now uh, regarding Abim's organizational structure. So without wasting our time, uh, I would like to explain among the ABIM's organizational structure and the committee's member in that organization. So first of all, why is when we look at the some movement or, or or department, they have a certain organizational structure. Why it is so important to them? It is um, to make sure that every administration process is run smoothly, if efficiently and effectively toward the purpose of the movement or one organization. Okay guys, first of all, we will take a look at the first slide which is about the ABIM's organizational structure. So, first we will talk about the ABIM Shura Supreme Council which is also known as the Majlis Shura Tertinggi ABIM in Malay and this department invades the top of the ABIM organizational structure and basically every major decision on specific issues will be referred to this department and it acts as the decision making of any related issue and any election of the leadership of ABIM whether in the central administration or state administration, the result will be decided by Majlis Shura Tertinggi Abim. And then, under Abim Shura Supreme Council, there are two leadership stage, which is uh, in the central level or in the state level of administration. Thank you so much, Dr. Farah Eliani. Now we move on to our last panel, which is Assistant Professor Dr. Ina Samiha. So, Professor Doctor, uh, for the first question, can you tell us about the contributions of ABIM in Malaysian society? Thank you to the moderator for the question. To answer the question, first we need to know that ABIM had played a role as an Islamic youth organization in carrying out various demands and programs which have significant impact on society. So now, I would like to mention several contributions made by ABIM to the society. ABIM played a big role in building Islamic generation. ABIM as a student-based Islamic movement had a close relation with student associations such as PKPIM and PMIUM. This symbiosis relationship is ABIM to spread the idea of Islamization which produce a generation that applies Islam and understand Islam in their daily lives. One of the important activities carried out by student associations to reinforce the Islamic program on campus was the members of PMIUM and PKPIM attended a leadership event organized by ABIM and PKPIM such as Latihan Angkatan Pendakwah Pelajar-Pelajar Islam Malaysia, LAPIM that was conducted in Malaysia. After getting good training, PMIUM started to hold its own leadership program. This program had a huge impact on Islamic awareness among students on campus. Entertainment activities which were contrary to Islamic law such as dancing parties and drinking alcohol were strongly opposed by Islamic activists on campus. Next, Islamic activities on campus or universities were actually contributed by the Islamic awareness nurtured before entering the university. As an example, Yayasan Anda was a private school 
established by Abim in 1972. There, the way of dressing and behaving according to Islam were enforced. The classes were divided into two to differentiate between male and female classes. Next, Abim also established new education institutions such as Taman Asuhan Kan Akana Islam, Sekolah Rendah Islam and Sekolah Menengah Islam. This established Islamic school spread Abim's idea of understanding Islam faster. The encouraging response from the society forcing the government to initiate preschool education and secondary school which are based on Islam which now become a normal phenomenon in Malaysia nowadays. Plus, the establishment of IIUM in 1983 was also related to the contribution of Abim's intellectual idea. Thank you. Okay. okay, so how about its international contributions? Thank you to the moderator for the question. So now we move on to Abim's contribution at an international level. Abim's relationship with international Islamic movement began as early as its establishment and were developed rapidly, especially during the leadership of Anwar Ibrahim. Various committees were formed by Abim to fight for Muslims who were oppressed internationally. So these are some of Abim's contributions at an international level. First, Abim helps minority Muslim groups. Abim condemned the massacre of Muslims in Moradabad, India by submitting a note of protest to the Indian government through the Indian High Commissioner at Indian Embassy. This note of protest was submitted by Anwar Ibrahim and Kamaruddin Muhammad Noor on 24 September 1980. Besides, regarding the issue of Muslims in Kashmir where its people were depressed by the violence committed by Indian Army also got the attention of Abim. Meanwhile, in Myanmar, the Rohingya community were discriminated causing Abim to ask the Myanmar government to respect human rights by immediately stop and end the activities of murder, oppression, deportation and destruction of property as well as detention without trial. Next, among the international issues, Abim was seriously concerned about Muslims in Palestine. Abim consistently fight for the issue of the establishment of Israel and in every publication, Abim often contained issues of violence and atrocities of the Jews towards Muslims in Palestine. On November 29, 1979, Abim issues a press statement expressing dissatisfaction and condemning the Israel establishment. Abim also urged the UN and OIC to be more concerned about the suffering of Muslims in Palestine. In fact, Abim urged the Malaysian government not to enter any trade relations with Israel. So, Abim's involvement at the international level had great implications for the fate of Muslims internationally. In context of Malaysians, Abim's involvement had succeeded in attracting sympathy of Malaysians on the problems of Muslims in other countries such as Palestine, Myanmar and India. Thank you very much to all speakers, um, the audience that had stayed with us uh, until this moment. So I hope everyone can benefit for what, from what it is shared in this forum. And we hope to see you in the next session, inshallah. Therefore, I end this session with uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. See you next time.